Hi everyone, this is lecture 8 for POS 273 International Relations, an online course taught at the University of Maine, and I am your instructor, Rob Glover. Today's lecture is on international organizations and law. Um, so we are going to talk about international law, uh, the mechanisms of international law, how it is created and enforced, and in particular there we'll be looking at how international law is sometimes a little bit different than um, probably our, our prevailing notion of law, how we think about law and the administration of justice at the domestic level. Um, so we'll talk about those things, um, some of those, those key differences and some of the ways in which international law is um, made and then implemented. And uh, we'll talk about international organizations um, and whether or not international organizations, some different perspectives on whether or not international organizations and international law are effective uh, whether they accomplish what they set out to accomplish, and whether or not they're just, whether or not we can talk about something um, as as uh, sweeping and uh, large in scope as international justice. And then we'll talk about some key examples of international uh, and regional intergovernmental organizations. Uh, we'll look at the United Nations, which in particular is going to be important in this class in that you'll be participating in this simulation in which you um, uh, play the role of certain key actors within the United Nations. And then we'll close by talking about a regional organization that I'm sure uh, you've probably heard of and, and uh, it's been in the news quite a bit recently, the European Union. Okay, so um, to start, we need to map out something called global governance. Um, we talked about global governance uh, briefly in this class. Global governance refers to, this is just the definition taken from your book, uh, the formal and informal processes and institutions that guide and control the activities of both state and non-state actors in the international system. Now we use that terminology global governance uh, and it's important to note that it doesn't mean global government. We have never had uh, a global government, we probably never will have anything approaching uh, a global government, at least not in the foreseeable future. Meaning that there is nothing at the international level that plays the same role, that has the same um, completely uh, unquestioned, unparalleled power to enforce, uh, to create and enforce law as the governments that we have at the domestic level. If you just think about the way that law and justice and, and uh, government operates at the domestic level uh, with you know, a clear body that makes the law and then clear mechanisms for enforcing the law, um, there's really nothing that exists like that over and above the level of the state. So global governance is always going to be some approximation of the functions that we expect from government uh, attempted to, to kind of scale that up to the international level, but it's not going to function in the same way, and it's generally not going to have the same degree of power. It will be problematic. There will be instances in which, uh, you know, the, a major international organization wants something to happen and states push back, and for the time being, at least, the states um, win. The states can uh, so sidestep the power of international organizations and global entities. Um, so global governance is what we're, everything that we talk about today will, is a part of global governance. Now, um, it's important to make one distinction between uh, institutions and organizations. When we use the terminology international institutions, we're referring to something kind of abstract. Uh, we're referring to norms and rules and practices that prescribe behavioral roles, they constrain activity, and they shape expectations. So examples of an international institution would be something like uh, sovereignty, right? At a very abstract level, the idea of state sovereignty, that states have expectations of autonomy with regard to their domestic affairs and non-interference from other states so long as they're not uh, threatening some, you know, country beyond their borders or some, uh, you know, stability of a certain region, uh, that would be an example of an international institution. It doesn't have to be as abstract as the idea of sovereignty, though. It can be something like a trade agreement, like NAFTA would be an example of an international institution. It prescribes certain behavioral roles, it constrains activity, and it shapes expectations, in this case around 
trade between uh, Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Um, so that's what we're talking about when we talk about institutions. When we talk about organizations, we're talking about something a lot more concrete. We're talking about physical entities that have concrete organizational structures, staffs, head offices, letterheads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? These are actual organizations that have a physical presence. They have a location. They have people that work for those international organizations. Um, an example would be uh, NATO that we've mentioned. This collective security alliance uh, that exists between the United States and certain countries in uh, Western and Central and Eastern Europe, um, that would be an example. You can go to NATO headquarters. Uh, NATO sends out, uh, you know, uh, documents and uh, the the representatives of NATO meet in in a, a, a physical space. Another example, uh, a little bit bigger in scope, would be the United Nations. Uh, you can go to UN headquarters. You can uh, receive communications from the United Nations. It is a physical entity. It has a concrete structure, staff, etc. So keep in mind that distinction. Try not to use those things interchangeably. Um, because they are important, and there's important implications in their differences. Okay, so um, we can talk about different levels of international institutions. There's one that we're going to focus on in particular. Um, constitutional international institutions would be deeply legitimated institutions that define and constitute the parameters of things like statehood, the parameters of what international relations is. An example, again, I'll use the same example, would be sovereignty. Uh, if you don't have something like sovereignty, international relations starts to look fundamentally different. If you don't have a concept of the nation state, international relations starts to take on a completely different character, right? So these are, if you think of it in terms of um, like language, this is almost like the grammar of international relations. If you decided that you were going to abandon the rules of grammar and make up some alternative uh, set of institutions and expectations with the way that you communicate, you would sound completely different. Uh, your communication would be rendered incomprehensible to those that still accepted that basic uh, expectation that we construct language and communicate with one another in a certain way. Same thing with these constitutional institutions. If we abandon sovereignty, if we abandon the idea of statehood, uh, if we abandon the idea that you know representatives of states can speak for their country as a whole um, and act in their behalf, international relations starts to look fundamentally different. So that's what we're talking about when we say constitutional institutions. Uh, they're important. They're crucially important, and some of the key ones, like state and sovereignty, we've already talked about. The next level is fundamental. These provide basic rules and practices that shape how states uh, uh, cooperate and coordinate with one another, shapes how states solve problems associated with cooperation and coordination. So, um, for example, these would think, be things like international law, uh, just the existence of international law, norms and expectations and behavior and ways of compelling states to behave according to a certain framework, a certain set of expectations. That would be an example of a fundamental institution. Multilateralism, which we'll talk about more today, the idea that the legitimate way to pursue your interests in the international arena is by engaging in diplomacy with other countries, usually large groups of other countries, to build consensus and to work towards uh, compromise and agreement that everyone can, can support. That would be uh, a fun, an example of a fundamental institution. Uh, Going down one level further is uh, issue-specific institutions, what are sometimes called regimes. These are um, institutional practices, again, fundamental in nature, but in a particular domain of international relations, usually uh, related to a specific issue area. So, you know, environmental, international environmental agreements would be an example. Uh, the law of the sea is an example. It's a whole series of stipulations about uh, where one's territorial waters begin, uh, how you en engage with others once you step outside those territorial waters, uh, what claims to resources within those waters you have, 
the Geneva Convention would be another example, a uh, series of um, international uh, agreements, conventions, law uh, relating to how we uh, behave towards one another in the context of conflict and warfare and how we treat prisoners of war and um, expectations for what types of weapons we use in, in conducting warfare. So that would be an example of issue specific. But as I said, um, this little red asterisk uh, d denotes that primarily today what we're going to be talking about is fundamental international institutions. So the creation of international law, the primary, me primary mechanism through which we create international law is multilateral diplomacy. When we say multilateral, that just means cooperation among three or more states. Um, so uh, cooperation between two states would be bilateral, cooperation between three states would be trilateral, and then once we get beyond that, we start saying multilateral, right? Um, the goal of that cooperation being to formulate reciprocally binding rules of contact, conduct. So uh, we're going to meet and we're going to talk about um, intellectual property rights. And the goal is we're going to arrive at some sort of agreement among, among these different country representatives uh, to figure out what are the, the rules that we're going to agree to. And then they're going to be reciprocally binding. So everybody's going to have to uh, abide by the rules of conduct that we reach. Um, international law is crafted in settings that are designed to facilitate that diplomacy. So this happens in international organizations, it happens within regional organizations, sometimes it happens within um, not you know, entities that have an established presence, but it'll happen within a trade summit. Or you know you see that oh the G7 are going to meet uh, in Switzerland and they're going to discuss a number of things related to trade and stability of the global financial system and what they're crafting there um, oftentimes is international law um, but it's not occurring in you know a, a specific um, uh, established setting uh, but things like the United Nations the EU African Union uh, APEC Arab League. Right. Oftentimes, they get together, and their 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 goal is to craft these reciprocally reciprocally binding rules of conduct. Conduct. Um, this so this is multilateral um, uh, uh, diplomacy is the primary mechanism that creates international law. Um, an interesting thing about uh, international law that sets it apart a little bit from domestic law is that states are only obligated to uh, observe international law to which they have consented. Right. So um, the consent process is a lot more formal in international law. States can, um, if there's a convention uh, that sets certain expectations for states, maybe you know, it relates to um, uh, certain uh, types of weapons that you say, you know, the people that sign on to this convention aren't going to use these types of weapons. They're not going to use uh, landmines, right? um, anti-personnel landmines. Um, the only countries that are actually bound to observe those rules of conduct are countries that have explicitly signed on to that piece of international law. If you haven't signed on to it, if you haven't consented to it, it doesn't apply to you. Um, so imagine then, you know, at the domestic level, if every law that you are subject to, everything that you are expected to do, everything that you're expected to, to not uh, transgress in domestic law, you had to formally consent to. So you get caught jaywalking and you say, well, you know, I never formally consented to the jaywalking convention. Um, that wouldn't fly in domestic law. You're expected to have awareness of the laws and you're expected to abide by them. But international law, it's a little bit different because of that expectation of state sovereignty that states can't be held to a standard um, that, that they haven't set for themselves within reason. Um, then states are only obliged to observe international law to which they've formally consented. So a little bit different. We're kind of in a little bit different territory. States can also sign on to international law with reservations. So say there's you know, a big complex piece of international law with lots of different uh, expectations. Uh, this happens a lot with uh, human rights. Uh, there's, uh, uh, for example, a Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is an attempt to create a piece of international law. Signatories to this uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child agree to abide by certain uh, expectations of the rights of children, 
that you know children aren't going to be um, uh, put at risk. Children aren't going to be used as soldiers. You agree to certain standards in terms of child labor, etc., etc., etc. Um, but states can sign on with reservations. States can sign sign on to a piece of legislation and say, well, we agree with 98% of what is here. These are our three reservations. These are the things that we are not going to agree to, uh, but we will sign on to the treaty and we will ratify it and we will be bound by it with these exceptions. Again, that's an area that's a little bit different than domestic law. You can't decide that you're going to um, you know, uh, follow the the tax code and tax laws for your income taxes, but say, oh, but these three pieces um, I don't agree to and I never formally consented to, so they don't apply to me. But that does happen in international law. Okay, um, One very important source of law is what's called customary law. Uh, customary law is just established practice over time. It's something that hasn't been formally codified in a convention or a treaty or a legal document to which states are, are formally bound. Um, but there have been expectations set. So the Geneva Convention, which I mentioned earlier, um, in a lot of ways, I mean, when they were formulated in the 20th century, they were addressing new technologies, they were addressing new forms of weapons that had come into being, but a lot of what they were doing, particularly with regard to you know, treatment of POWs and things like that, was formalizing things that had pretty much been the expectation in the course of warfare over the last 100 years. It was pretty much what we'd been doing in our international interactions with other countries, um, but it hadn't been formally codified anywhere. So a lot of times when states go to formulate a piece of international law, it's a matter of taking uh, the practice, what has kind of informally sprung up over time, and just formally laying it out and then getting countries to, to formally agree to it. So it's just clear and precise what exactly the expectations uh, are in international relations and international affairs. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, it, the, the customary law can also be introduced in international legal proceedings. So even if a country has not signed on to a specific treaty or uh, uh, ratified a specific convention, they can be held to things if you can make a credible case that there was an established practice and something that a country or a corporation had done was so far outside of that established practice and that custom that it constitutes a breach of law. But that's a much harder case to make. And overwhelmingly, the direction in international law is codification, writing things down, getting people to sign on formally. Uh, it's much easier to hold states and other actors accountable when it's clearly specified what the law is. Okay. So that's a quick overview of um, international law. Enforcing international law is a little bit tricky. Um, <clears throat> one of the critiques of international law, one of the things that people will inevitab inevitably say about international law is that it is not law. Um, it is, they'll say it's unenforced or it's unenforceable. And that's true in a sense, but in a very limited sense. Um, it, International law is not enforced in the traditional way that domestic law is enforced. So it's there is no global police force. Um, if I decide that I'm going to go, you know, 80 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone, um, and and I get caught doing that by the police, then I'm going to be run through the justice system, and I'm going to be, uh, you know, fined or have my license taken away. And there's this expectation that that's going to happen. If that didn't happen, then that says something about our ability to enforce justice at the domestic level. Um, there's nothing like that in international law. There's nothing that's, that is that clear cut and that is that formulaic. But that does not mean that international law is unenforced or and it certainly doesn't mean that it's unenforceable. So what are some of the mechanisms of enforcement for international law? Um, one way that this can be done is through incorporation of international law into domestic law. So say that we sign on to a big um, agreement on climate change, right? And there are certain targets that have to be met in terms of carbon emissions over time. We have to draw down our carbon emission over time. Well, one way that we can do that, one way that we can ensure that we're in compliance with that international law is to then craft domestic legislation 
that holds us to those standards. So, you know, if, if this is the target we need to hit, then we establish emission standards and we hold uh, companies and individuals accountable if they step outside of those emission standards. So we can just incorporate the international law into our domestic law and approve it through, um, you know, our, our legislature or our parliament, whatever our domestic legal system is. That's one way. Um, another way, uh, assuming that there has been some breach of international law, is international condemnation. Um, so if a country does something, you know, uh, invades another country or mm -hmm. takes over another country's territory, uh, and this is viewed as uh, particularly uh, problematic, then uh, members of the international community, uh, countries, uh, representatives of those countries can call out that country for breaking international law. And sometimes that's enough. You know, just condemnation um, can be powerful if states don't want to be viewed as... Uh, you know, defying the global community or being some sort of um, pariah in this larger community of states. It can also es escalate to threats and coercive diplomacy. So, um, you know, a country does, again, uh, invades an another country or, or does something that's viewed as destabilizing or threatening. Uh, countries can say, well, you know, that's, you stepped out, out of, uh, out of, out of bounds there. And so here's what's going to happen. Here's what we will do if you don't justify this and make the, uh, rectify this and make this right. Okay. So threats, coercive diplomacy, um, either publicly or behind closed doors, you know, that's, that's a strategic move that states would have to decide what will they think, uh, will be more effective in, in those cases. Uh, another mechanism of enforcement is international courts. We have um, a number of international courts. Uh, there is, through the UN, there's something called the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, which is a, a court that exists at the international level for resolving disputes between states. We have the International Criminal Court, which is a court that has been established to um, try individuals who have engaged in crimes against humanity or war crimes. Uh, so these are settings in which disputes could be brought or individuals could be punished for something that they did that was, uh, you know, egregious enough to be considered a crime against humanity or a war crime. So there are these settings. There are a host of other international courts. There's usually courts at the regional level. Um, so there's a court associated with the Organization of American States that can try cases um, in North, Central, and South America. There's a European Court of Justice that uh, can try cases specific to Europe, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are a whole host of different international settings in which you can attempt to enforce international law. Punitive measures by other states. Um, so this goes back to what we were talking about with foreign policy. Uh, this is kind of the stick. Uh, <laughs> embargoes, uh, targeted embargoes or just blanket embargoes of a certain country's goods, economic sanctions, uh, oftentimes, uh, you'll see the suspension of diplomatic relations. If a country, you know, so fundamentally disagrees with something that a country has done, they will pull out their diplomats and uh, kind of close up shop on their diplomatic presence within a country, which may not have, you know, a very tangible material effect, but symbolically, that's very important. Um, we actually just reopened our embassy in Havana, Cuba, after decades of not having a diplomatic presence in Cuba. Um, and that was viewed as a kind of a symbolic moment of a real change in the relationship between the United States and Cuba. Um, so that's another punitive measure that could be undertaken. Kind of the last resort is military measures. Um, this is probably the least uh, ideal way of enforcing international law. These could be things like uh, bombing, a targeted military strike. It can even be invasion and occupation. It's generally the last resort. Um, we, don't, we don't want to live in a world in which the only way that we can enforce international law is getting our military to go in and uh, invade other countries and occupy them when they break international law. It would generally have to be for something extremely, extremely severe uh, that threatens either the stability of a specific region or just the, the stability and uh, safety of the world as a whole. Um, and even then, it would probably have to be a pattern 
of activities. It wouldn't be you know, a single kind of transgression. It would be a country that uh, for a very long time had been engaging in action uh, that was viewed as, as threatening and destabilizing and, and needed to be severely, severely punished. And usually all of those other mechanisms of enforcement, um, the attempts, the various ways to attempt to uh, ensure that a state complies with international law probably would have happened first before uh, we see the military measures, but not always. Um, really depends on the foreign policy of the specific country that's engaging in the military action. So let it never be said that there are not ways of enforcing international law. There, there are ways of enforcing international law. They're imperfect. Um, as most things are imperfect at the international level. But there are a variety of ways in which we can attempt to enforce international law. All right, so some critiques of international law. Um, many, many people are critical of international law. Uh, I'm going to look at three here, um, just really briefly, uh, two of which you'll have been exposed to and maybe kind of anticipated some of these critiques. Uh, and then one other one, which we haven't talked about, a lot yet, um, but it's a common critique of international law. Um, the first real set of critics of international law would be realists. Um, realists are going to be critical of international law because, in general, they they have a statist view, right? They they view the international system as state centric. So countries are the most important units, and there's nothing over and above countries that can compel them to do anything. Um, really, if you're a powerful country and you decide you want to do something, provided that you're powerful enough, you can probably get away with it. That's the realist worldview. And so realists look at international law and they see international law is really a function of what the major powers want. You can have international law, but if it doesn't coincide with what the major powers want, then they're not going to enforce it. And so can we really call that justice? Can anything like justice exist at the international level? Uh, they would say that law, the actual law itself, the laws that are created, the conventions that are created, the treaties that we arrive at, um, those things are a function of power. And the outcomes, the way in which the law is enforced, are a function of power. And anything that purports to be global justice or international justice, they would scoff at. They would say, no, what you're calling international justice is really a reflection of the major powers and, and what they want to see in the international system. Marxists have kind of a similar critique, um, although they come at it not necessarily strictly from the point of view of um, power, but more specifically uh, wealth and resources. So Marxists would say that international law reflects uh, this unequal hierarchy of wealth and resources that exists within countries, but it also exists at the global level. And so they would say that law and outcomes, um, the law itself and the outcomes, the way that the law is enforced, really reflect the will of wealthy elites more than justice. So again, they would be critical of just the idea of international law. A third critique um, that comes a lot from kind of the developing world and, and non-Western countries is that international law, as it's currently constructed, the institutions that we have, the way that the international organizations have been set up, uh, the norms, expectations, uh, even right down to just the articulation of, you know, what are rights? What are the human rights that we want to protect for individuals? Um, how, what are the expectations associated with, um, you know, being a country and having citizens that you have to guarantee certain rights to? Um, they would say that it reflects Western assumptions. They would say that these major organizations were set up by Western powers uh, and reflect a constellation of power that really emerged during European imperialism. And so the law and the, the law itself and the outcomes, the way the, that the law is uh, administered and decided and acted upon, reflect Western cultural dominance more than justice. Right. So there are a variety of critiques of international law. There's some different angles that you can approach international law from, but there, there are folks who are very, very critical of international law. Um, now, liberals obviously are um, going to have much more faith in international law. They're going to have much more faith in the idea of international justice or global justice, the idea of uh, institutions and cooperation, and that international organizations can uh, create settings that facilitate multilateral diplomacy and um, hopefully create 
law and create expectations and norms which are reflective of the global community rather than any one set of powers, right? They really have faith that this is possible. Um, liberals in general will recognize too that that might take time and this is an imperfect process and it, it's going to be incremental to create organizations and, and institutions that really reflect that global justice. But again, they would take the long view. <laughs> they would say, a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, we didn't have anything that looked remotely like this. And the fact that we've created these organizations like the United Nations and um, and and um, moved in this direction shows the capacity for human progress. So they would have a much more uh, optimistic and hopeful perspective on international law. Okay. So we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk about the United Nations. Um, as I said, the United Nations is one of the key um, international organizations, probably the key international organization that exists uh, in the world today. So we're going to talk a little bit about the United Nations, um, its overall structure, and we'll also delve into two key branches, functions of the United Nations, uh, the General Assembly and the UN Security Council uh, that you, the, the UN Security Council, you will get to know intimately through your participation in the ICON simulation, which you take on the role of countries, uh, country representatives to the UN Security Council. All right, so this is, um, this is a basic kind of organizational chart of the United Nations system. Um, it's kind of like an org chart for the United Nations. Um, now, the, the first thing that I would say is I'm not going to go through all of this, um, but what you'll hopefully notice is that the UN is broad in its scope and pretty um, complex in terms of just bureaucratic construction. Uh, it's actually... One of the major critiques of the UN is that there is it's a complex organizational structure, there's a lot of overlapping mission, there's all these commissions and bodies and agencies and funds and programs and organizations and um, and it's so it's just a complex complex system that sometimes is a little bit bureaucratic and a little bit slow moving. Um, the response to that, the rejoinder to that comment is that so is any national government. You know, you could look at a chart of the organizational structure of the United States federal government that looked like this and was probably even more complex than this. Um, and the United Nations is responsible for the world as a whole. Its scope is global in nature. So, um, so that's <laughs> somewhat to be expected. Um, the United Nations was created in the aftermath of World War II um, and in many ways grew out of the crisis of World War II. Uh, we talked about this in one of the first lectures in which we said that, you know, World War II was so bad and the suffering that was inflicted as a result of World War II was so severe that a lot of our major international organizations emerged out of it. It was a terrible, terrible experience for all of humanity. Um, but we did have this kind of growth and in, in the recognition of the need for international organizations that hopefully could prevent some of the carnage in the future. Now, some of the organizations within the United Nations system actually predate the UN. Um, so one example uh, is, is the International Labor Organization. That was a part of the precursor to the United Nations known as the League of Nations, which again, I think we talked a little bit uh, about in the lecture on history of the international system. This idea that you know we would create some sort of international entity that would uh, craft norms and international law and prevent World War I, things like World War I from happening. Um, so some of some of the sub organizations, sub agencies within the United Nations system actually predate it. The key thing that I want you to focus on in this chart is the um, principal organs of the UN: um, the General Assembly, Assembly, the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, the Secretariat, and the International Court of Justice. Um, trusteeship Council is a little bit complex. It's technically one of the principal organs, but uh, it is kind of dormant because its key function was to oversee countries that were uh, newly created and newly emerged from colonial rule. Um, those countries would be put in trusteeship until they reached a point where they were stable enough to 
be independent countries. And uh, we haven't had any of those countries for quite some time. So it's, it doesn't really serve a function anymore. So really it's these key five functions. Um, the scope of the United Nations system is laid out in its charter. And it's pretty far reaching. I mean, it deals with everything from its primary function, which is international peace and security, to some of these more social functions. Some of these organizations you've certainly heard of. Um, the UN Development Program deals with economic development. Uh, the UN Environmental Program is an international uh, uh, fund program that deals with environment, uh, environmental issues in a variety of different domains. Um, some of these organizations are uh, really well known for the, the work that they've done on uh, social and economic issues. Um, the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, has won the Nobel Peace Prize for some of the work that it's done on behalf of uh, children throughout the world. The World Food Program is the UN's um, uh, organization that deals with food security and hunger. Uh, and I believe they are also uh, Nobel Prize winners, Nobel Peace Prize winners. Um, so there's a variety of kind of sub-entities. Um, the two that we're going to focus in on here are the General Assembly, Assembly and the Security Council. The Economic and Social Council are important, and some of those sub-agencies will come up later in some of the um, subsequent topics that we talk about. So we will talk about the UNEP uh, when we talk about uh, environmental issues. We'll talk about the UNDP when we talk about economic development. Um, but we're not going to go into them in a great deal um, right now. The Secretariat is kind of the formal... Um, the formal uh, functioning head of the organization. Uh, it's the, the home of the Secretary General and his staff. It's currently Ban Ki-moon. Um, so that is an entity that tries to oversee this vast bureaucracy and provide some sort of coordination, some sort of uh, kind of central uh, control over the organization. Uh, and the International Court of Justice is... Um, a court that exists to hear disputes between states. Um, so if an issue emerged and two countries were having a dispute and they wanted a legal setting in which they could air their dispute, the ICJ would be a setting in which they could do so. Uh, it's also an entity that doesn't, we don't see it used very often uh, in the United Nations system. It doesn't hear a lot of cases. It's not uh, incredibly active. Um, it's a function of <clears throat> several things. Um, one of them is the difficulty in enforcing decisions. So there have been instances in which the ICJ has reached a decision uh, and it's been summarily disregarded by uh, the country that has been found you know, having to do something, provide restitution or stop a certain action. Um, it also reflects the growth of some of these regional organizations that we'll be talking about that also have regional uh, mechanisms for justice over and above the state level um, and the development of things like the International Criminal Court. So there's a lot of um, kind of uh, justice uh, institutions of justice over and above the level of the state. And so the ICJ, as that growth has happened, has kind of um, been pushed aside as one of the key ones. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the General Assembly. It's the closest thing that we have to a global parliament. Uh, and it's, it's said to function as a parliament of nations. It's a very egalitarian institution. Powers distributed relatively equally. All member countries get uh, representation and equal vote. And I will just say as an aside um, that virtually every country in the world right now is a member of the United Nations. There are a few holdouts that are not members of the United Nations. In general, they'll, they'll send some sort of representative, but they haven't become formal members. Um, one is the Vatican, which sees potential problems with uh, so the Vatican, the Holy See, is a country, it's a sovereign nation, but it sees potential problems with uh, essentially what is a small section of Rome that is the home of the Catholic Church having a, a, a formal vote in the UN General Assembly and being a formal member. Um, Kosovo, I think, has, is not yet a member of the UN General Assembly. I think there's about four countries that um, are not members of the UN General Assembly. Taiwan is actually not a member of um, the UN Gen General Assembly because it, oh, it's a complex, um, a complex 
story to get into, but essentially it, it involves Taiwan viewing itself as the rightful heir to um, power and uh, the serving as a head of government in China. Right, Taiwan was created through a, the Chinese Civil War, and these nationalists ended up in Taiwan after getting chased out of China. Uh, and so, while it's technically a, a separate sovereign country, they they view China as rightfully theirs. So, um, so they essentially it's a protest uh, over. The, the Chinese Communist government um, are not formal members of the UN General Assembly uh, or the, the United Nations as a whole. Anyway, that's an interesting story if you want to look it up. Um, okay, so the UN General Assembly um, is a setting in which all member countries get representation and an equal vote. They can uh, consider, deliberate, and vote on any issue within the scope of the UN Charter. The UN Charter is this initial document that lays out the mission and the mandate of the UN, of the United Nations. Um, it's very, very broad. The Charter of the UN essentially deals with virtually any world issue that you could think of. Um, so really, most anything that would happen in the world um, falls within the scope of the UN Charter and therefore can be taken up at the UN General Assembly. Um, they pass what are called resolutions. Um, for most of those resolutions, in order for them to pass, it needs a simple majority vote, 50% plus one. In certain instances, in certain important decisions, the General Assembly needs a two-thirds majority vote. So if it were to make a major decision on something related to world peace or security, um, you know, whether or not it was going to authorize a certain military action that was going to be taken, uh, or admission of new members. There was a country that was petitioning the UN to become a member. Um, say there was, you know, a, a breakaway republic, a secessionist movement in some country, and they formed their own country. Um, and they wanted UN recognition. They wanted to be recognized as a sovereign nation and, and enter into that community, the global community that makes up the General Assembly and the United Nations as a whole, uh, that would require a two-thirds majority vote. But for most instances, um, all you need is a majority vote. What is the status of these General Assembly resolutions? They are recommendations. That's it. Um, the decisions reached by the General Assembly are only recommendations, and there's no formal body within the UN that can compel states to comply with General Assembly resolutions. So as a result, General Assembly, uh, Assembly resolutions um, are sometimes disregarded, particularly if there's a General Assembly resolution that is uh, critical of a major power. There's been a number of instances in which you know there's been some uh, resolution calling on the United States to stop doing something, uh, and it's overwhelmingly past the General Assembly, and um, the United States will simply disregard it. It will recognize that, that the General Assembly has made a resolution, uh, and they might try to get you know two or three other countries to, to sign on with them to vote against that resolution, but it doesn't actually change their behavior. Um, so that's disappointing in a certain sense. Um, but the other thing to note is that there's really not a lot of demand among member states for anything that would compel states to comply with UN General Assembly resolutions. These are states. They value their sovereignty. They value their autonomy. They want to be able to act without uh, impediment. So there isn't a lot of push for the UN General Assembly to have uh, what are sometimes called teeth, right? If something has teeth, you have the ability to enforce it. You have the ability to compel um, people to comply with it, and the UN General Assembly is not that. But it is an important uh, voice for the global community, right? And so if, if something uh, is passes as a resolution in the General Assembly, we can say that it represents the will of the global community, which we can hopefully use uh, to, to compel some sort of action or compel a change in something that's happening uh, that we don't want to see happening. So it's not, I don't want to be completely dismissive, dismissive of the UN General Assembly, but it does not have, it is, it is not a good analog to our Congress, for example, where there are a whole set of domestic institutions which work to compel people to comply with the law. That doesn't really happen at the General Assembly. Um, <clears throat> the other organ of the United Nations that we're going to talk about is the Security Council. The Security Council is smaller in scope. Uh, there's only 15 member states, and it is assigned primary responsibility for the maintenance of global peace and security. Um, so there are those 15 states, 
It's been that way since the 1960s. Initially, I think it was 11 states, and they bumped it up to 15 member states, and I think it was 1965. Um, and of those 15 member states, there are five permanent, member, five permanent members and 10 rotating members. The permanent members are the United States, the UK, France, Russia, and China. And the value of being a permanent member is that you are always on the Security Council. You will always be a member of the Security Council. Um, whereas the other 10 states on that are going to rotate. They serve a certain term and then they rotate off and new members come in. So you're always going to have a seat at that very important table and you have veto power, right? So if any one of those countries, if there's uh, a resolution that's being debated in the UN Security Council and any one of those five countries decides that they don't like it, they can shut it down. Security Council resolutions have to get nine votes in order to pass, but uh, they also have to avoid that veto by any of the permanent five powers. Um, once a Security Council resolution is reached, what are the steps that the UN Security Council can take? Um, there's a, a variety of them. Again, it's nothing as direct as what we see in our domestic institutions. It's not like um, uh, what we see happen with our, you know, the United States government and our Congress and our executive branch. Uh, it's different because we're operating at the international level. So the UN Security Council can condemn actions that it views as threatening and destabilizing, and some resolutions are just that. They're saying, you know, what country X is doing is not in the interest of peace and security, and it's bad, and it's it's uh, destabilizing, and we should they should stop it, right? That might be a resolution. They can also suggest principles for mediation or resolving a dispute. So if members of the UN Security Council see two countries that are on the, the fast track to go to war with one another, and they're both kind of you know arguing back and forth and um, becoming more and more confrontational, and they see that as a potential problem, then they can suggest principles for mediation or even suggest here's an outline of what a resolution of this dispute might look like from the UN Security Council. Uh, they can authorize economic sanctions, they can authorize arms embargoes, or other coercive measures, but the key thing is that states are going to have to be the ones to actually undertake those coercive measures, because they don't have any way to compel states to, uh, you know, not sell arms to a specific country, or not have any economic dealings with a certain country. So. They can authorize things that give a certain legitimacy to economic sanctions and arms embargoes, but they can't actually do them. They don't have that power. Authorize the use of offensive military force by states so they can um, approve uh, a, a state or a set of states going in in a specific situation and using military force, invading a country or um, you know, doing something, uh, engaging in bombing or uh, some sort of limited military strike. Um, the UN Security Council can provide, again, a certain legitimation to that strategy. And then lastly, the UN Security Council can authorize the deployment of a UN peacekeeping force. There are no offensive UN forces. Um, the UN would not you know, authorize an offensive force to go in and um, engage in bombing or engage in uh, you know, kind of offensive military action. Uh, it has never been part of their mandate. It has never been part of their charter. What they can do is authorize a peacekeeping force. So say there was uh, a civil war in a country and it had been ripped apart for decades and some sort of tentative peace had been reached by the warring parties and they were really, really hope the uh, representatives of that country were really, really hoping that <clears throat> it's not going to descend into conflict again. The UN Security Council can authorize a peacekeeping force to go there. Um, it does not have a standing peacekeeping force. So when the UN Security Council authorizes a peacekeeping force, of which there are about a dozen or 15 active in the world right now, they have to go to individual states and kind of pass the hat, say, okay, we've authorized this peacekeeping force, here's what we need. We need money, we need personnel, we need troops, we need hardware, what are you willing to provide? And then gradually they build sufficient resources and sufficient troops to go in to a specific area and um, and serve as a peacekeeping force. But that is, that is not anything like an offensive military force. They have very, very limited uh, rules of engagement 
um, a very, very extensive rules of engagement and a very limited mandate for using force. Um, basically, they can only use force when they actively see someone uh, engaging in something that threatens peace or stability. Right? So if they see something transpiring, then they can step in and, and use their weapons. But in general, they're just there to kind of um, to to play a stabilizing role, not to engage in military operations or anything uh, more extensive than simply being there and, and being a, a presence to kind of keep the peace. Okay, So there are a series of steps that the UN Security Council can take if a resolution is reached and uh, none of the permanent five members veto that resolution. The UN Security Council can authorize the use of offensive military force by states. So again, the action is taking place um, driven by states, and it would be national military forces that are actually involved in the use of offensive military force. But the UN Security Council can kind of mandate that. They can um, say that it has a certain legitimacy and give it their, their seal of approval. Um, so whether that be... Uh, a bombing campaign or a limited military strike or something more extensive, the UN Security Council has the ability to authorize that use of force. That's another step that the Security Council can take. Lastly, the UN Security Council can authorize the deployment of a UN peacekeeping force. Um, a UN peacekeeping force, there are a number of peacekeeping operations throughout the world. Um, I think there's roughly a dozen or 15 peacekeeping operations happening right now at this time. And the ultimate mandate for that comes from the UN Security Council. They say that this is a situation in which there should be a peacekeeping force. Now that does entail a military presence. It's a different type of military presence than you might get from a national military. UN peacekeepers are the, um, you know, the soldiers that you see in the blue helmets. Um, and in general, the types of peacekeeping operations that the UN Security Council supports and then the UN pursues are situations in which there has been a conflict, there's some sort of uneasy truce, um, a cessation of conflict, and then the UN is sent in as a force to try to ensure that things don't spiral back into a conflict. It's a lot of civil wars, a lot of um, domestic uh, internal wars. Uh, and conflicts that the UN peacekeeping force is sent in after the fact to attempt to prevent it from happening again. With that said, um, UN peacekeepers and the authorization of a UN peacekeeping force does not mean that all of a sudden uh, 20,000 soldiers are in a location in the next day or the next week. Once a UN peacekeeping force is authorized, it is dependent upon states to provide troops, personnel, funding, military hardware, etc. So once that authorization happens from the UN Security Council, then uh, that begins a process of going to individual countries and saying, what can you provide for this very UN, very important UN peacekeeping force? What can you provide in terms of troops? How much money are you willing to give? Uh, how much military hardware will you provide? So it can mean that uh, there's a significant lag between the authorization of a UN peacekeeping force and its eventual presence on the ground. Also, UN peacekeeping forces have very strict rules of engagement and a very limited mandate. They can't engage in um, strategic operations. They can't go in and target specific violent actors within a society and uh, attempt to take them out. Um, they don't engage in in you know, warfare in the way that a uh, national military might. They are there to ensure that um, people who are vulnerable remain safe and to basically oversee and ensure that things don't spiral back into conflict. So it's a pretty extensive rules of engagement and pretty uh, extensive limitations on how and when they can use force. So those are some of the tools, uh, some of the steps that the UN Security Council has at its disposal to try to fulfill that broader mission of ensuring uh, peace and uh, international security uh, through the United Nations. All right, now there's three main critiques of the UN Security Council that I'll just briefly go through. Um, the UN Security Council has come under fire in a variety of different instances, and these are 
usually when someone is critiquing the UN Security Council, uh, these are the ones that you, these are the critiques that you you tend to hear. The first is the um, uh, relates to the permanent five, uh, the countries with veto power, a lot of uh, criticism of the current composition of the permanent five uh, definitely reflects kind of a post-World War II mindset and the constellation of power that existed at that time. And many have said, you know, why is a country like Germany not part of the permanent five now, uh, so long after World War II, or a country like Japan, or the recognition of uh, rising powers like a uh, country like Brazil or India, uh, some of the largest economies in the world, significant military uh, capabilities. How how are they not part of the permanent five? So there's been critiques of the um, the the permanent five and suggestions that maybe that needs to be opened up more broadly. Um, also in terms of regional representation. And some have said that, you know, there needs to be broader regional representation. We don't have a country from Latin America. We don't have a country from Africa in the permanent five. Um, composition of the council generally is also a concern. Um, the idea that maybe the, the composition of the council should be broadened. Uh, and much like we did in the 1960s when the uh, UN Security Council was expanded from uh, 11 members to 15 members, maybe we need another expansion to account for some of the ways in which the world and the distribution of power throughout the world has changed since that time. Uh, many people critique the problematic effects of veto power. If one country decides to block a UN Security Council resolution, if one country uh, in that permanent five decides that there is a step that they don't think the international community sh should take, it doesn't happen. And in many instances, that can uh, result in action simply not happening, particularly if one of the permanent five has some sort of vested interest in a country that might be a target of a UN Security Council resolution, uh, or if they're concerned about the precedent that a UN Security Council resolution might set. So if they're doing something, if one of the countries in the permanent five is doing something similar uh, to what the resolution would target or critique or condemn, uh, then they might block that action. And lastly, um, a major critique of the UN Security Council is just its speed and its ability to act in crisis situations. Many of the things that come before the Security Council are fluid, unfolding, developing situations. And if action isn't taken quickly, it can mean significant loss of life, it can mean the escalation of a conflict um, further than it, it currently is. Uh, in some cases, it can even mean uh, genocide or just horrific humanitarian crises uh, unfolding. And as we said, when the UN Security Council even manages to get uh, a, a resolution uh, passed and the per members of the Permanent Five don't block it and it gets the sufficient votes that it needs in order to be approved, uh, it can still be very, very slow for there to be uh, actual authorization of action uh, and so some have said, <clears throat> we need to rethink the UN as a, as a security tool and to think about ways in which we can make it more efficient, make it more, act more quickly. Um, so that's a broad overview of the United Nations and some of the, the key administrative organs of the United Nations. The United Nations is um, the key international organization uh, that, that represents the entire world. And um, to the extent that we have something that uh, can can serve that function, a, a setting for cooperation and coordination, dealing with issues that are truly global in scope, it is the United Nations. Um, but there are a number of problems and a number of challenges that the United Nations will face. I encourage you to read the section on the UN in your book, which goes into uh, more detail on some of these issues, uh, which um, are probably going to surface and emerge uh, as we do the simulation. So definitely check out those pages in your chapter and read them closely. Um, occurring alongside this trend of international organizations is the growing development of regional organizations. Uh, there are a variety of them. Um, virtually every region in the world has some sort of major regional organization, which again is a setting for multilateral diplomacy, it's a setting for the creation of international law, it's a setting, uh, 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 setting in which countries can come together and try to uh, address issues that they face as a region. And the most prominent one, and really one of the, the 
remarkable stories of international relations over the past 60 years or so is the formation of the European Union. I'm going to go through some of the steps uh, that led to the creation of the uh, modern European Union um, and talk about some of its functions today, all of which were, were painstakingly crafted over time. Uh, it, it was a process, uh, a decades-long process for the European Union to become the important uh, regional organization that it is today. When we do that, when we talk about those uh, processes, we use a couple terms that I just want to explain, and I think they're a helpful way to think about how the EU uh, came into being over time and how it's grown and developed. The first is widening. Um, widening just refers to the geographical expansion of the EU with the addition of new member states. Uh, the EU began as something called the European Community in 1958, uh, which is six countries, and now has grown to 28 countries. Uh, so there's been a significant geographical expansion and several new member states added. The other term that's sometimes used is deepening. Um, deepening doesn't refer to geographical expansion. It refers to the expansion of collaboration to new policy areas. Um, so this began in a, a pretty... Um, kind of limited way in the 1950s with uh, some agreements to cooperate on the production and allocation of coal and steel um, by just six countries. And now the mandate of the EU, the scope of the EU, in some way uh, touches upon really every major policy area that, that one could imagine. Anything that has some sort of European component from agricultural policy to foreign policy to education policy, um, has uh, the EU plays an important role in shaping that policy. So that term deepening refers to this expansion of collaboration to new policy areas. If we look at uh, the growth of the EU, you can see that uh, it has expanded significantly and there have been waves of expansion. So these countries uh, that are in dark red in the center are those six initial countries. You had uh, Germany, Italy, and France, and uh, also what we call the Benelux countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Uh, and those were the six countries that kind of initially came together to form the European community. And then over time, there have been expansions. In the 1970s, uh, you had the addition of uh, the UK and Ireland. In the 1980s, you had the addition of um, Greece and Spain and Portugal. Um, 1990s, some of the Scandinavian countries joined uh, and then a, a significant wave of expansion in the 2000s. Uh, these are primarily countries that had had communist regimes that had been part of uh, the quote-unquote Soviet bloc. They were Eastern and Central European countries that had communist political systems and were heavily influenced by the Soviet Union and the formation of their foreign policy and their domestic policy. And they underwent transitions after the Soviet Union collapsed in the 1990s uh, set up democratic systems, moved towards more capitalist economic systems, and by the 2000s had achieved a state of um, stability and consolidation of their political institutions that they were ready to be admitted into the European Union. Uh, and so there was this significant, significant expansion that happened in uh, 2004, the countries like Hungary and Poland and a series of um, uh, Central European and Eastern European countries. And then uh, 2007, a little bit later, you had the addition of uh, Bulgaria and Romania. It's unclear um, what countries uh, could potentially be part of widening in the future. Uh, there was discussion of uh, Russia potentially being the next member of the European Union. There's always been a little bit of hesitancy about that and questions of whether or not Russia even views itself as a European country or would want to be part of the European Union. And certainly um, the kind of foreign policy and, and geopolitical uh, developments of the last few years um, might shut the door on Russia becoming part of the European Union anytime soon. Another country that's frequently talked about as a potential member of the European Union is Turkey. Um, and Turkey is actually a candidate for membership at this point, um, but there is um, a number of um, complications with their uh, 
they're joining. Um, Iceland is another country that could potentially become a member. So there are a few remaining uh, candidates for membership, but really the scope of the EU now is um, is Europe wide. And after initially a very kind of auspicious beginning with only six countries. So the widening has been significant um, and significant, uh, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years. We've also seen uh, a parallel expansion of policy uh, domains and and uh, this deepening that we talked about. If you look at the EU institutions, I'm not going to go into these in any great detail. Um, I just want you to know that they exist. There is a table on chapter uh, in chapter uh, five of your book on page 172 that talks about some of these uh, institutions and their functions. But the key thing that I want you to note here is really that any um, administrative policy function that you have at the national level has been replicated on the European level. So um, the legislative branch, the executive branch, the judicial branch, there's some parallel corresponding European level institution uh, in addition to the national parliaments and um, executive branches and judicial branches that exist within countries. Those things don't go away. They're not replaced. Um, but they do have corresponding institutions at the European level. It means that those national institutions have to share their power with these EU-level institutions. Uh, and increasingly, as the scope of the EU has grown, we've seen instances in which um, the European institutions do, in some cases, have the power to override uh, national institutions. Um, so the European Court of Justice, for example, can issue... Uh, decisions in cases which then supersede the justice system within an individual level country. Um, so, you know, if there's been a decision uh, that is then appealed to the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Justice overturns a um, earlier uh, decision at the national level, then that will supersede um, that country's national judicial system. Um, that's pretty striking. Uh, it's, it's striking that we have European level institutions that have that degree of power and that degree of legitimacy to do that. Um, so this is really a remarkable process, the creation of these institutions. Um, and, uh, it says something about, um, the willingness of these countries to be part of a European level set of institutions. Um, I'll go through just kind of a, a quick timeline of some of the major developments in the European Union. Uh, and this is incomplete, but it gives you a sense of the scale of European integration, some of the ways in which um, the European Union has driven uh, greater cooperation and collaboration forward. Really, the initial purpose, the initial goal of the European Union was to create what's called a common market. Um, in, in really general terms, that means that uh, trade, commerce, economic activity that happened within Europe would happen as if it was ha uh, as if it was taking place in a in a single uh, national economy. So um, when you uh, send goods around the different states within the United States, they are not subjected to the scrutiny, the trade barriers, the customs uh, e expectations that they, they would be if they were going into another country's economy. Um, and that was what the folks at the, within the European, at that point, community and later European Union were pushing for. They said, you know, we have all of these, we have a relatively small geographical area, but we have all of these national economies, and we need to ensure that commerce and trade and economic activity happen as if it was happening within a single country. Um, so the goal from the 1950s, really up until the 1990s, when some of this was solidified, was to break down barriers to trade, break down barriers to um, the movement of goods, the movement of money uh, within the European community, right? Um, and that was a goal that was largely achieved. Some of those, those barriers to trade uh, were broken down, and really um, the European Union today, for all intents and purposes, uh, functions as a single economy as opposed to, you know, 20 or 28 different national economies. There are also um, attempts to remove border controls for movement of EU citizens. So in the same way that goods uh, and services and money 
were subjected to all sorts of controls related to national borders. They wanted to eliminate those border controls. So prior to 1995, if you wanted to go from, uh, you know, uh, Spain to France and you had come up to a national border, you were going to go through a process much like uh, what we would do if we were going from the United States to Canada or the U.S. to Mexico or vice versa. Um, now, if you travel within the EU, you um, notice that you cross over borders and it's not, it's almost, you don't even notice it. Um, it's it's similar to, you know, uh, going from Massachusetts to Rhode Island, right? You see a sign that makes you aware that you're in a different country, uh, but there aren't elaborate border checks and there isn't a whole kind of border patrol system set up. And that was because of cooperation at the European level. Um, they wanted to eliminate border controls for the movement of EU citizens um, and just basically make it easier to travel, make it easier to move and establish residence in EU countries. Uh, if you were a member of another EU country and you wanted to move to a new country to facilitate and, and make that process easier. And the European Union was the setting in which that was all worked out. There was something called the Schengen Agreement where um, they worked that out. One of the major developments and something that you're certainly aware of if you've traveled to the European Union was the establishment of a single central bank with the goal of the introduction of a common currency, the euro. And this happened in the late 1990s. In, the 19, in 1998, they created something called the European Central Bank. And in 1999, they introduced the euro, which was uh, a currency that displaced national currencies. So, you know, if you were using German Deutschmarks or um, Francs or Drachna or you know, Lira, whatever it is, whatever your national currency was, and you had signed on to the euro, then uh, you were going to use this common currency. And monetary policy, how much money was in circulation, how that money flowed back and forth, um, that was going to be determined by a European central bank, which is a really significant step. Um, that, was, that involved countries that were part of the Eurozone saying, okay, traditionally we have at the national level had control over monetary policy and our money supply, and uh, how much money is printed and how it's made available to banks and lending institutions and things like that. But we're going to turn over that power over our monetary supply to a European central bank in which we'll have some say and some control, but we're also going to have to collaborate and coordinate with lots of other national economies and uh, representatives of different countries. So this is a really significant step. 1999, the establishment of a European security and defense policy, which is one of the big sticking points for uh, negotiations about further deepening. Countries are really, really reluctant to uh, give up control uh, or complete control over security policy, defense policy, foreign policy. But there was the establishment of a European security and defense policy, which is a basic outline for how, they're, how these different European countries are going to collaborate on foreign policy and security issues. Um, and they did establish a European force um, that was first deployed in 2003. So there is a European level um, uh, uh, force, uh, largely for peacekeeping efforts, um, existing alongside national armies and militaries. So a major, major step uh, for sovereign countries to cede some of that control to a regional organization as opposed to having it at the national level. Um, there was a long, long period of attempting to ratify a European constitution, and um, it failed on a couple of accounts, in large part because similar to how our constitution was ratified, um, it needed to gain uh, a, a, a positive vote of, in a referendum at the national level in each of the European member countries, and there were certain countries that voted it down. Um, and so there's something called the Lisbon Treaty, which basically took earlier versions of a European constitution and um, brought it to a national vote. And that was ratified and enacted. So there is uh, what basically amounts to a charter of the EU, uh, lays out its scope, lays out how it's going to function. And that was ratified and eventually enacted uh, in 2008 to 2009, ratified in 2008 and enacted in 2009. So really significant process, uh, progress that's happened in European integration. And whatever problems the European Union faces now, uh, it is remarkable that a continent which for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, had basically been at constant war with one another, is now seeing this degree of cooperation, 
coordination, collaboration, multilateral diplomacy, establishing international law at the regional level. It's a really remarkable achievement. It's the type of thing that if you had a liberal perspective on international relations, you would point to and say, look at this remarkable progress that has been made. How can we say that countries don't seek cooperation and collaboration as a means to stability and order? Okay, there are some challenges. Um, and we'll talk briefly about those challenges, and some of these challenges will come up a little bit later in the course as we deal with specific issue areas. Uh, one is that sustaining progress at deepening is difficult as they move towards more challenging areas of collaboration and cooperation. One is immigration. As you expand the, um, the European Union, as it widens, as a different group of countries become members of the European Union, and it's been a real serious challenge uh, with immigration. What we have seen is um, some of these more recent member countries, countries like Romania and Bulgaria and um, Poland, um, have different economies than Western Europe. They're at a different level of economic development. And so there has been, as the European Union expands, there's been a push uh, westward. These um, countries, we see a lot of uh, particularly young men go, uh, going to the Western economies where um, there's uh, you know potentially better job opportunities, a better standard of living. They can do more and make more as young workers. Um, and that has brought some, some challenges. That was one of the big fears about expansion was, oh, this is going to create these immigration patterns that are going to have effects on our economy and open us up to all sorts of competition that didn't exist before in terms of labor. Uh, and that has been an issue, and it's at times it's it's kind of strained things. Um, we're also seeing immigration um, uh, across the Mediterranean as some of the countries in North Africa, particularly all the volatility they've experienced recently in places like um, you know Libya and Tunisia. Um, we're seeing a, an upward migration um, that has. Puts, uh, p there's been some challenges in the European Union in terms of how do you deal with these influx of people, um, oftentimes fleeing terrible situations, right? Fleeing uh, countries that are war torn and unstable and seeking opportunity. Um, how do the countries that are on the front lines of those immigration flows deal with them? And how does the European Union as a whole coordinate uh, efforts in that regard? Uh, how do we kind of harmonize our immigration policy? And there's there's been some contention there. Um, a continued issue of of um, a, a challenge that the European Union faces as it attempts to collaborate more is security and defense policy. Um, as we said, there's there's been an outline of a, a collective security and defense policy, but we still see. Um, pretty deep internal divisions within the European Union over the security and defense policy um, happening alongside that widening. Again, you have countries with very different um, degrees of power in the international system and very different military capacities and different perspectives on foreign affairs. Uh, and so we did see a split in the European Union, for example, over the war in Iraq. We saw some countries that were um, willing to support the United States and even willing to provide troops. And we saw some countries that were dead set against the war in Iraq and viewed it as a misstep and would not vote for it, would not support it at the United Nations. Um, but then the problem is that you have a common security and defense policy that uh, expects those countries with different perspectives on foreign policy and different perspectives on security to work together for European purposes. So that's a challenge, right? When you have countries with different foreign policy perspectives trying to craft some sort of common approach to um, security and defense. The major challenge, the big challenge, uh, if you type in European Union challenge in Google, what you will find is the financial challenge, um, the economic challenge. So um, as we said, Europe, the European Union has a common currency. There is something called the Eurozone and countries within it share a currency and they share a central bank, the European Central Bank, that makes really, really important decisions uh, for national economies. And um, now that the EU has grown in such a way that you have all of these member countries 
again, similar to uh, some of the challenges associated with immigration, you have really, really different national economies uh, all lumped together in the Eurozone. You have some countries that um, are incredibly robust, incredibly wealthy, doing really well, manage their money responsibly, keep low levels of public debt. Uh, and you have some countries that don't. And um, some countries that just have a different economic profile. But the problem is with a European Central Bank and a shared common currency, oftentimes uh, they have to work together. And they're subject to the same conditions for things like access to, to loans and money and things like that. And the real challenge that we've seen over the past 10 years or so is um, tensions within the European Union uh, from the more stable economic powers towards some of the less stable economies. Uh, we saw this happen to a certain extent with um, Spain and Italy, and really right now the kind of flashpoint for, um, for issues related to the economy and financial challenges is Greece. Uh, Greece is um, suffering a, an economic crisis, and there are concerns in throughout the rest of the Eurozone that uh, Greece's economic crisis might spread. And so they uh, placed certain conditions on uh, Greece's availability to emergency loans, emergency credit, and um, said that they had to um, engage in uh, some policy changes and change um, their, the way that they provided public pensions and the amount of uh, spending that they're going to engage in, increase their tax rates in certain instances, and um, really kind of put uh, Greece in a, a difficult position of belt tightening economically in order to stem some of its some of its economic problems and prevent them from spreading to the eurozone. And Greece has just recently said, well, these, this is an unrealistic set of expectations. We're not going to meet our um, uh, expected debt payments, and we're not going to engage in any of any further um, uh, austerity measures or any of these things imposed by the European Central Bank and other international organizations. So the question of whether the Eurozone will remain, the composition will remain the same, and particularly whether Greece will continue to use the Euro is very much an open question right now, and that's all unfolding. But it gives you a sense of the challenges just associated with something like the European Union, where you have different national uh, governments and different national economies trying to work together, even though the conditions that exist in those countries and in those economies are very different. Right? There's very different levels of wealth and standard of living and uh, approaches to how you engage in economic policy. So that's the big challenge. That will be something that they'll have to confront in the near future. Um, beyond the EU, there are a range of other regional intergovernmental organizations. So the whole time we've been seeing this process of greater international collaboration at organizations like the European Union, we've been seeing the same thing happen in virtually every other region in the world. You have something called the African Union in Africa, you have the Organization of American States, APEC in Asia, uh, ASEAN, uh, which is another Asian organization. There's organizations in South Asia. Um, there's uh, the Arab League that uh, is a range of countries in the Middle East and the broader Middle East. So this trend towards regional intergovernmental organizations is another important um, thing to note, is that we see these organizations for regional collaboration um, developing, sometimes focused on specific issue areas, sometimes focused on you know, economics or trade, and sometimes with a much broader mandate than that. So um, this is going to continue to develop, to develop over time, I would imagine. Still, however, by far the most developed of these regional organizations is the European Union. I think it's the model towards... Um, it's the model that a lot of these or, um, other regional organizations are striving towards. So really interesting set of developments um, happening often um, in most cases within the past 20 years or so, 30 years or so, these organizations have sprung up. All right, so we're going to wrap up there. That has been a quick overview of um, international law, international organizations, and then a look at two of the major international organizations, one truly international in scope, global in scope, the United Nations, 
and then the other, a regional organization. For next time, we start to get into some of the other actors involved in um, global governance. Uh, we talk about non-governmental organizations primarily, um, but we're also just going to briefly mention some of the other uh, entities, actors that can shape global governance beyond non-governmental organizations. So in your book, read, um, it's just a very brief section of chapter five that deals with non-governmental organizations and some of these other actors. And as you do so, think about what are the most important non-governmental actors in global politics. And ask yourself if globalization has increased the power of these actors to influence international relations. I think that's the implicit argument used oftentimes when we talk about NGOs, uh, is that globalization has somehow increased their power and they have a greater role to play in international relations. Think about whether or not you agree with that. And um, if so, if you think that that is the case, how does that happen? How do these actors have more power because of globalization? So we'll wrap up there for now and pick up with NGOs next time. Thanks very much.